Ready to clap? One, two, three. <laughs> Whoa, Did that so work? Fast. <laughs> I know. I, I feel like I was. I, I don't know what I, I was like doing. Throwing a body over a cliff, and I just wasn't ready. <laughs> okay, hoist. One, two, three. Oh shoot! <laughs> I don't know why I did it like that. Just throw the body. Um, yeah, <laughs> very unprofessional. We are back, baby. The red light is on. We are recording. Boom. And yeah, we're going through Characteristics of a Disciple right now, a video series that we did. We just talked about in episode five, the word, Man. its accessibility to every believer. Man. And number two, according to Acts 2, fellowship, baby. Communion. Fellowship. Breaking of bread. Man. What is so communion? Um when Acts 2, we're, we're quoting from Acts 2, 42 through 46 or something. Um, when we're talking about the breaking of bread, here's my question to you. We're talking about like when you go to your local building, your local church, and uh, once every quarter you have a wafer and a little thing of uh, bad wine. And call it a day, right? That's what the commandment is, right, Carl? <laughs> or is there, is there, or like, is there something? I feel like is there something more to it? Is there something that we're missing? Fill, fill me in. I feel like we should never ever go viral because our lives <laughs> are be real difficult after, especially we ask it. You know, I am. I really love one of the things I love about being a brethren Baptist or a Baptist brethren, whatever category you want to put me in, right? Conservative, <laughs> blah blah blah. Don't put me in a box. Lives in the hood. Which, by the way, I feel like Mr. Rogers, I love my life. Thank you, Lord. That question, we first have to start with mercy. Like, that immediately brings comfort to the conversation. Because, let me tell you about, you know this about my background, and I, I really hope a lot of Bear Lakers are listening, because Bear Lake Bible Camp was such a powerful, just setting for where God did an awesome work in my heart, where I learned to ask questions and to to have discussions with people who I disagreed with. Mm. And it got me ready, really, uh, to get ready to have discussions with my family members and heal old hurts and go back and talk with people that I feel like I could have handled the conversations differently. But one of it is just there were so many people, at, you know, running at Bear Lake Bible Camp 2014 through 2017. Uh, Emily and I lived there on grounds, a Christian ministry, camping, and... Um, I was we worked together in 2011. That's don't right. That's don't right. forget That's it. Right. Senior staff shout out. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Eric Sandberg. <laughs> Eric Sandberg, yo. <laughs> Colorado. And Lisa couldn't do it without her. His wife was such a wonderful encouragement to me and so many other people. But, but anyways, that place is special for so many reasons. But what I learned being an overseer and managing the outside groups that spent time on the grounds running their own retreats. When I would sit down and talk with pastors that were women from other churches that I disagreed with, or I would just want to know, why do you believe what you believe? How did you arrive there? What, what do, mm-hmm. How much of a role does the, this book have to do with the decisions that you and the people that you roll with are making and follow, as you follow Jesus? Yeah. And I met people that I was like, there's no way I could fellowship with you. I didn't say that. I wasn't like, oh, psh, I'm done. Get out my face. No, you know, it's just I learned to be amicable. I learned how to be peaceful and, mm-hmm. and encouraging. Like those people would leave those conversations feeling like they received something from me and, and vice versa. So it, it, the conversation has to start with mercy. I understand that people do it different ways. And when we look at this book, I can see how some people gather certain things. But what are the things that we need to understand? Watch the video. You're going to understand the key things. We acknowledge it. But really, we overlook some of the details that are given. We talk so much when we, about communion, about all these details that aren't given, about whether the, cu- the, the cup was divided. Did, they have, did everybody have their own cup? Or were they drinking yep. from one cup? Yep. Was, it, was it wine that was fermented? How fermented was it? It's like, all right. Listen. Is gluten-free permissible? <laughs> <laughs> You're ruining the sacrament. <laughs> okay. Like, come on, guys. Remember, Jesus said, foreshadowing this, preaching the hardest message he ever preached and killed his church, quote-unquote, and only had 12 left. He said that people that have eternal life that will live forever, they're going to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Mm. The whole point is those people are going to remember him. Mm. They're going to remember him. 
and they're going to do it together. And what is what's the significance of his blood? The, the eating, I mean, eating, even eating him, consuming him, taking him physically. When we sit down with people and we eat, there is camaraderie. There is sharing mm. that's taking place. There is mm. common ground. There is a heritage. And when there's fellowship that's eternal, man, I mean, I have a general idea of what that sounds like, at least to the point where I know I want it with God because I'm experiencing it now with other people who God is in. You know, I'm watching God change other people where I'm like, I can't believe I get to live life with you in this city. I have a guy, a neighbor, Zachariah, a young guy coming from Pennsylvania, living next door with his wife, helping minister in this neighborhood. That's why they moved here, to love our community. That's stuff that I read in books. But now mm-hmm. I get to live it because we're praying with confidence, because mm-hmm. we believe that God has designed us for community, even to be members of one body. Mm-hmm. And so when we start to understand that, and eating is no longer just eating. How can I eat and drink and bring glory to God? You ever think about that? Why do you say something like that? Well, because yeah. when I eat and drink, I'm with believers, and I'm remembering the most important thing, something so valuable and precious. Malachi tells us that God has a book that he opens up and records when people discuss him, when they have fellowship and they think about the day when we will be with him. Faith no more, but by sight we'll see the Lord and will be changed even into his likeness, never to be ashamed ever again. Truly, the tears will be wiped away. So, I mean, when we look at this, it's it's so much bigger. We don't care about how many cups there are. I don't care if you're drinking wine that's fermented or how fermented it is or what process. Whatever, bro. You know drunkenness is a sin. I'm not debating anything else. You know, you go on, go on, go on. So, yeah, bro, that's the start to that question. Yeah, and and let me throw something in there, too, that that sort of combats this idea Mm -hmm. that that communion is just just this one moment per week or per quarter that you do. That 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 when Acts two is talking about fellowship and breaking of bread, it's not talking about even if you do it weekly, mm-hmm. this fifteen minute part in your week. In John six that you quoted, um, or sort of paraphrased, when when Jesus is saying you got to eat of my body, that's a relatively controversial. Well, it was controversial at the time, but it's a controversial piece of scripture. I think um, the, the the Catholic. Church has taken that uh, to to mean one thing, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. uh, and and we believe it to be something mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. But consider what Jesus is saying. I'm going to get a little bit Greeky or nerdy on you, mm-hmm. but just bear mm-hmm. with me. Mm-hmm. The I word open up my software. Bible yeah, the, works. When Jesus yeah. says, when Jesus said that to the people, he, the word that he uses was used kind of when we talk about cows grazing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay? Mm-hmm. So this was a study that I did on this a, a while ago, a friend of mine who had this just This is the John out, 6 passage you said? This is John 6, yeah, John oh. 6. When he's talking about it, um, he's talking, the, the word that he uses, it means, it means grazing. It means to continually eat. If we are thinking about communion, it, if we are taking you know, Jesus in, in, in that literal sense, we have to be doing the bread and the wine just all the time for us to be obedient to that. Jesus is not just talking about that sacrament that he gives to us, but he's talking about when we meet together, we are continually mm-hmm. eating. I'll put that in quotes, mm-hmm. but eating of his flesh, drinking of his blood, but continually grazing upon who he is and what he's done for us, there is nothing in John 6 that connotes that this is a thing that we do ritually, you know, once a day Mm -hmm. or once a week Mm -hmm. or once a quarter. It is continual. Mm -hmm. It's grazing like a cow grazes on grass. Have you ever watched a horse or a cow eat? Have you ever seen them stop? They don't. Communion is not just this one this one thing that we do. It is to be really trendy. It is a lifestyle of the believer to be with people. You know, when we meet together, we are continually grazing. Yeah. We don't typically break yeah. out the bread and the wine, but we are having communion with one another. We are fellowshipping in the breaking of bread yeah. when we're with each other because yeah. we're continually grazing so, on on his death burial. So and this is good. And I wanna start I wanted to shift gears and I wanted to talk a little bit about what we had already referenced earlier, which uh off camera, which was Mephibosheth, right? Just really quickly, I'm gonna try and just 
take the highlights of it because people you can, you got google now you got no excuse you got google mm-hmm. you got no excuse you can look this up yourself okay we're not gonna have spoon feed you you should have your own pastor you should have your own elders whatever you call them you should have your own gathering of people who are devoted to this like shaolin monks all right so uh, we're all not we're all working our way there it's a discipline work together but man mephibosheth is the grandson of the enemy of David, Saul yes. the king. King David. Yes. Mm-hmm. Break. Okay, so he, by any other kingdom, would be killed. And even in Israel, that becomes the trend later on, killing yep. and uh, the, the heirs to the throne to so, gain so, power. So to be clear... The King Saul mm-hmm. has has just passed away. His 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 heir has passed away with mm-hmm. him, Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And so now David has taken over, and by all accounts, by by the, the 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 history of every king before him or most kings before him, what you do Clean then is exterminate. Right. You exterminate the line right. of the previous king, so Break that you down. have no threats going forward. That's right. Continue. Yeah. You strengthen so Bathes, yourself. He's. he's He's on the execution. That's block, right, and the and and David doesn't ever. The axe never comes, right? The execution mm-hmm. never comes. David never comes. Armed men never come. Mephibosheth lives his life in peace. And by the way, Mephibosheth is lame. He's he's got issues with his legs because he was injured as a child. Because when David came into power, everybody in Saul's family freaked out because they just knew David was going to kill everybody, and they were wrong. They were wrong. And so in the rush and the hurry, uh, the nurse falls and injures Mephibosheth as a baby. And so mm. that's why he's lame. And so it's interesting, this fear of this pending wrath. Could you imagine having a life like that where the king yeah. ha- should hate you by mm. anyone else's? I mean, could you have having having that nurse, the one who broke your body trying to get away from him, thinking she's helping you? Could you imagine being raised by that lady? <laughs> Well, how, how do you feel about yourself, and how do you freaking feel about King David? He's not your friend. You better shut up. You know, one day it's coming, by the way. I don't know if I told you that. You know, and then you get this invitation, because he remembers an oath that he has with somebody that he loved so much that just your mere connection to that person is enough for him to invite you to be as one of his sons. So first of all, the love of David and Jonathan is what really blows us away. And that serves as the foundation for what brings, it's the covenant relationship that David and Jonathan have. It's just so amazing, it's mind-blowing, that David and Jonathan love each other. They said, hey, we had, they had a pact that they would show kindness to one another and their, specifically their, their families, their offspring, no matter what happened. And so he comes into power. He says, who in the house of Saul can I show kindness to remembering his covenant? There's, it's, it, there's no condition. It's going to be met. It will be fulfilled by one party or the other. And David is the stronger party now. And, you know, it's interesting. With our covenant with God, God is the stronger party. And so he sent someone, right, to be the one who, with whom he would make the covenant and the promise through, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so it's mm-hmm. through Jesus Christ, because of the covenant relationship that we have with God the Father through his Son by the power of his Spirit, right? As uh, mm-hmm. Ephesians chapter uh, 2, I think verse 18, will help you understand the relationship that our triune God has with man and the way that he's brought about justice and mercy in one, one plan. And that's impressive. Yep. And so uh, that's the picture, that's the picture. Mephibosheth, all these Old Testament pictures. Ask God to open your heart and your mind, and he will give instruction, as my brother Ben has shared in another episode. So this is... Yeah, so, so bringing, it, bringing it back to communion, or fellowship around the table, tie that in. What is Mephibosheth? Yes, brother. Um, sitting at the table with King David, what are we to pull away from, yes. from, this, from this story? That as amazing of a rags-to-riches story or doom to the greatest desire being fulfilled or met or received, those type of stories, all that is, it's met in the story of Mephibosheth, which is true, it's history. And so he now is invited to eat because of the kindness shown by King David, because of the relationship and the covenant with Jonathan, secures this beautiful grace, nothing earned, unmerited favor from the king, and he eats Mm -hmm. as one of his sons with an heir. He even is given 
uh, property. Yes. He's restored and inherited land, all this stuff. And equal with David's oh, e- yes. equal with David's family. Yes. He is he is he is right there. Yes. This is like this is he's a part of the kingdom. He's is adopted yes. essentially. Yes, he has an yeah. inheritance. And so we see, of course, that actually later on, he doesn't even care about the land. He just wants David. Like yeah. he has an opportunity to like I mean, he, it's not he doesn't care about the land. We see that later on in you know, family, you could read about that. But but for us we have the son. We sit at his table. We eat with him. I can be John. I can. Yeah. I can be. I can be nuzzled up against the author of life. Amazing. Mm. Amazing. Yes. And I can have it now. I can have it today. Yeah. I can have it today. Yeah. In 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 Romans eight, we learn that we we have received not the not the spirit of slavery, but the mm-hmm. spirit of adoption mm-hmm. as sons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and, and the reason why that's an important distinction, you know, saying, saying sons, is in, in those times, sons were the ones who, uh, who were given the inheritance. And so whether you are, uh, no matter your gender, you, you, you have inheritance just like sons did mm-hmm. back in those that's times nice. when Paul was writing that. Mm-hmm. The wonderful thing about about the table, fellowship around the table that is under Christ Jesus, what Acts 2 is talking mm. about, the second pillar mm. of a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Um, it, it is, I, I, I go to Colossians 3, and Colossians 3, um, verse, uh, verse 11, mm. it says, Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, right. slave, free, mm-hmm. but Christ is all. And in all, right. essentially, when you are around the the communion table, mm-hmm. as we are as we are defining it right now, I'm not talking about the quarterly thing you do at church. I'm talking about <laughs> when you are with the your local believers, mm-hmm. other Christians, and you are gathered together. Mm-hmm. There is no distinction of persons whether you are coming in and you make. Thirty thousand dollars a year, <laughs> right. and the guy sitting next to you is a multimillionaire. Right. You are both, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, equalized That's by right. that, and both sons right. of the Most High, inheritors alongside Christ, as it says yeah. in Romans eight as well. We are all equal. There is no distinction. Yeah. There is no Jew or Greek or man or woman, yeah. barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free. Yeah, and to be clear, especially that, in this time where. You know, gender and sex is really up for grabs, apparently, how people define it and what the rules are. Yeah. Remembering that we're not saying here that in Christ and in church there's no such thing as gender or as sex. Yes, or sir. Like that. I mean, we're, we're, just yes. to be clear, what we're establishing and saying is that the trajectory, we know, what it, mm-hmm. I'm not going to get into that. What matters is at some point in time, after he gathers the believers, Revelation 19 tells us that there is a celebration and a feast to commemorate or to acknowledge the completion of the union. No longer are we promised to Christ, but now we are joined with him in the way that he promised we would be. And so it says, starting at verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed or clothed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine mm. linen is the righteousness of saints. Mm. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. This is amazing. That's the picture. That's the finish line. Yes. Sitting in fellowship and celebration with Jesus. For those listening, you know, may this just be. We hope that this encourages you that that around the communion table. Mm-hmm. Again, I have to put that in quotes. The communion. It's not just about that time and church where you do that thing that everyone's kind of weirded out about because every church does it differently. Right. It's not right. what it's about. No. It is about coming together yes. around a table Ooh. in. Uh, equality mm. under Christ. Mm-hmm. Christ is all mm-hmm. and in mm-hmm. all. There mm. is no distinction mm-hmm. when it comes to how how God views us if Christ is our mm-hmm. substitution, mm-hmm. Uh, if Christ is standing in place mm-hmm. of, of what we would be without him, which yeah. is nothing. And just simply, uh, I mean, just damned. very simply, do you know him? 
And do you yes. have a relationship with him? And if you do, would you come, would you share with him? So what's the point of what we're talking about, right? I mean, what, mm. what's the takeaway? If you Tell remember me. anything today, right? I really want to just draw the the everybody, even my attention to Revelation mm. 3, the end of Revelation. And just look at what Jesus talks about. He says that he stands at the door and that he knocks and if any man hears his voice and opens the door, he will come into him and will sup or eat or dine with him and he with Jesus. And to him that overcometh, this is the type of fellowship they'll enjoy. That even as he overcame also and is set down with his father, that's Jesus with the father, in his throne, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So the person who overcomes with Christ, because by faith in Jesus we overcome the world, even the devil and his power, which is death, that is in our resurrection, will be truly realized. We, the believer, can have confidence knowing that if the fellowship starts with Jesus, hearing his words, listening to him, learning of him, right? Matthew 11, right? Learning of him, taking on his yoke and walking with him. The burden is light because he's carrying the load, right? He's carrying the load. Mm. That fellowship with others also forever, even forever. Need, if need be, we go through sorrow and, and calamity and hardship and, and trials. But even as Jesus did, with the confidence that as he came through, even through death, unto life, that we also will be carried by that same power, even the power of the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us. And as you said earlier so eloquently, he testifies, he gives witness that we are children, even heirs of God. So this is good stuff, man. People need to research it. Ask God for wisdom. And as you've said before, receive with reverent expectation. So yeah, brother. Living Shema is produced by Benjamin Foote and Carl Wellborn Jr. Our intro and outro music was produced by Jason Vaughn. If you have a question, comment, or quip, please contact us via email at livingshemaofficial at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.